Can you remember a time when you felt blissfully contented, even just for a few moments? Hi, my name is Heather Hart, and I'd like to welcome you to the second week of our Contentment Bible Study here on the Love Your Bible Study podcast. And I remember this one time, my family and I went on vacation in Florida, and we were on the beach on the Gulf of Mexico, and it was so beautiful, and my family was all happy and splashy in the waves, and I felt blissfully content right up until the sand bugs came out. And isn't that how it always is, that contentment, when you find it in certain things in the world, it's always short-lived. Whether it's because life moves on, or the sand bugs come out, or something always comes and steals that joy from you. That's what we're gonna be talking about today in our lesson. We're in chapter one of Contentment, Healing the Hunger of Our Hearts by Ann Woodcock. And today we're gonna to be looking at some verses in Ecclesiastes. We're gonna start with Ecclesiastes 1, one through four. It says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain? by the toil at which he toils under the sun. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. So the question in the book is, how does the teacher feel about life? And we can see that he is unimpressed. He finds it wearisome and he's a little bit disparaged. He finds it all vanity. Do you find this surprising? He was the king, he was rich, and in our culture, he would have been described as having it all. But do the rich, famous, and important people really have it all? Marilyn Monroe would be one person that people thought of as having it all. She was famous, she was rich, she was beautiful, but she ended her life in suicide. Robin Williams was one of the greatest actors of all times, and he also ended his life with suicide. Recently, there was a man in the news, his name was Twitch. He was funny, he was popular, and he also took his own life. These are people that we thought had it all, yet they obviously knew they didn't. They still knew they were lacking. So what were they missing? What do the people who try to find their contentment in the things of this world miss? The answer to that is Jesus. When we try to satisfy ourselves with discontentment, we will never be content. So the next thing that, that Ann Woodcock asks us to look at in the book is all the different ways that the teacher in Ecclesiastes looked for meaning and contentment. In verses 1, 16 through 18, we found that he looked to wisdom, but instead of finding it, he found vexation and sorrow. He found death. In chapter 2, he found pleasure, or he looked for it in pleasure and productivity, possessions, power, and prestige, but in all those things he found they were just vanity. Towards the end of chapter two, he tried to find meaning for life in striving and working hard, but he found that you can't take it with you when you die and there is no rest for people who are always working. And in Psalms we're told that God grants rest to those he loves. So we shouldn't be striving and working all the time. Question four in the book says, look at the list of things the teacher turned to in order to find meaning and fulfillment. Where do you see the same search in our lives of the people around us? The people of today's world look for meaning in many of the same things that the teacher did. In drugs and alcohol, in shopping and workaholism, in money or homemaking. They try to find it in their family or friends or even in their kids or grandkids. They try to find it in their health and fitness, in staying busy and working hard. They might try to find their meaning in TV shows or something on their phone, an app. Ecclesiastes 2, 24 through 25 says, There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat? or who can have enjoyment. There is nothing wrong with enjoying your life. Our life is a gift from God, but without him, it is meaningless. So I wanna read from Ecclesiastes chapter nine. It says, 
But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in their hand are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and to him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner, and he always swears, and he who swears as he who shuns the oath. This is an evil that is in all that is under the sun. The same that event happens to all. Also the hearts of children of man are full of evil and madness in their hearts while they live. And after that they go to the dead. But he who has joined the living has hope. For the living dog is better than the dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy has already perished. And forever they have no more, no more share in all that is done under the sun. So go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. Let not the oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because your portion in life in, in your toil in which you toil under the sun, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom and shield to which you are going. So in these verses, he mentions the one great problem for us that makes everything under the sun meaningless. That problem is death. Without Jesus, death looks like the end of everything. Nothing we did will matter without Jesus. So in view of that, what is the best we can hope for in this life? And the answer to that question is enjoyment. All we can do is hope that we enjoy the life that we have. And I wanted to read a couple more verses. The first one is from 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And then John 10, 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. In the book Contentment by Ann Woodcock, she shares some verses from Ecclesiastes. Verse 1, 13 says, I devoted myself to study and explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. And chapter 3, verse 10 through 11 says, I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. What is the burden that God has laid on humankind? That's what they're talking about in those verses. God has given us a desire for eternity, a desire for more than this world has to offer. So why do you think God did that? Why did God give us desire for more than we can find on this planet? And I think the answer to that is that we live in a fallen world, but we were made for more. We were made for a relationship. That's not something that can be placed by the things of this world. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to the God who gave it the end of a matter all has been heard fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing whether good or evil so the teacher's conclusion is that we will all die but not everyone knows Jesus and their death will feel meaningless. So what do we do with that? What do we do when we know we all die? And the answer is that we long for more of Jesus. 
The option is to seek him or to run from him. And if you want your life to have meaning, you have to run to Jesus. On page 48 in the study guidebook, Ms. Woodcock asks the question, how can the teacher's wisdom help us deal with our own discontent? And I think we have to accept that we live in a fallen world that can't make us happy. Our discontent should turn us back to the one who created us. Instead of causing more discontent, it should be an arrow pointing to the one who can give us contentment. So to summarize, and again, this is in the book, it's on page 47. It says, we cannot find contentment in our world because everything has been spoiled as a consequence of human rebellion against God. Most importantly, we all face death. It is right to enjoy the many good gifts from God, but we can only enjoy them if we don't think too much about the meaning of life. So however we live, we cannot find contentment under the sun. We have to look beyond the sun to God himself for the answers. Again, this is Heather Hart. You can find the book Contentment by Ann Woodcock on Amazon, and there will be a link in the notes, show notes. Thanks for joining me for the Love Your Bible Study podcast.